Welcome to the True Love Secrets Revealed interview series with experts. Today, we are having with us the unbelievable Laura Chidol. Laura is a former, former attorney, best-selling author. Your book is called Flaunt, I believe. Yes, it is. International speaker and life choreographer. You'll have to tell us more about that. Love it. Laura works with female professionals whose lives have been shattered by betrayal, whether that betrayal is from themselves, their careers, or someone that they love, and want to turn their situation around into a powerful force for good. Thank you, Laura, for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to this. Me too. It's a pleasure, a pleasure to have you. So let's dive right in. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question about infidelity and betrayal. So how to go from surviving to thriving after going through that experience of infidelity? How we rebuild? Yeah, yeah. It's such a tough one. And I think the most important thing to realize is we don't go from that complete devastation to where we want to be overnight. And when it hurts so bad, and when you are so gutted and your whole life has been up, turned upside down, the only thing that you want is to be okay again. Like right. you want it to go away. You just want to be okay again. And the best way to get there is actually to spend time where you're at. Mm. It's to, yeah, to give yourself the time to feel those feelings, to cry, to rage, to do whatever it is, and to just give yourself that gift of space so you can feel your feelings. Because if you try to rush through in this panic, I'm going to fix it. You end up making decisions that sometimes you can't go back from. Hmm. And you end up slowing down your healing journey. Wow, that is beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. So the first step would be stop and feel the feelings. It's something that we have such a hard time doing sometimes, mostly when we don't want to feel those feelings of being inadequate or maybe feeling like we are not good enough. So that that's, that's important to, to do it. There is a way to feel those feelings that you recommend any practice in particular? You know, yeah, that's a great question. Most people are different. So mm -hmm. there's not necessarily like a right or a wrong way. Love but it. one of my favorite ways is to allow yourself silence, to turn off the radio, to turn off the podcast, to turn off whatever it is, and to just be with yourself in a place of silence. I like to be outside in nature, mm. but just, yeah, having that silence to not constantly be distracted and to just sit with yourself and to turn into your body and to feel what comes up. And sometimes I also like to just ask myself, and I recommend my clients do this too, ask yourself, what do you feel and where do you feel? Mm. where in the body you mean yes yes because it's so easy to get stuck in the story in your head he did this to me and after I did this and then this happened blah, 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 and then the energy is up here and then we want to fix things so there's all this noise and when we can stop and be like I'm horrified right I'm embarrassed where is embarrassment in my body? Oh, it's in my throat. And I might feel shame at not wanting to speak. And oh, the horror. Wow, that's in my back. It feels like I've been stabbed in the back. And wow, oh, my shoulders, they feel heavy. To go through and identify what's happening in your body and to just give yourself that quiet place to feel what and where you are feeling things. Right, right. That is so important. As women, we feel so much with our body. And sometimes, as you said, we, we are in our head and we are disconnected with the body. 
And so what happens if we don't listen to those feelings? What happened with them? Different things. First of all, they are heard. They feel heard. Our body feels heard. That part of our identity feels heard. Right. Because it's just like if you've ever been with a group of kids in a classroom. The loudest kid sometimes is just the kid that wants to be heard the most. Right. And that's how it is with us too. Our grief wants to be heard. Our pain wants to be heard. Our sadness wants to be heard. So when you actually take the time to listen, it's heard and it can minimize. It can mm-hmm. quiet down. It knows it's being there because our feelings are there to protect us. Right. Right. Write yeah. that down. The feelings are there to protect us, to give us a sign, no? like of something is wrong here, and I need to to really, really take a look into this. I don't yeah. know if that was right. I can, I can. Um, sometimes yeah. I say things that don't connect. I I saw on your face that didn't connect. So we no, I, I was just thinking. No, that's actually very true. Oh, that's okay. yeah, that's that's very true because. Whatever is coming up is valid. Whatever is coming up is valid in your experience. And I love that you went there and then even questioned it because that's something that we do sometimes because it's like, well, is this embarrassment? Why am I embarrassed? I didn't do something wrong. And then sometimes we will judge our own feelings and we're judging, I shouldn't be feeling this way. I shouldn't be thinking that. And then it's like, it doesn't matter if you should or shouldn't, you are. Yeah. And that's what matters. And that's why that's really important to just notice it. It's there for a reason. Notice what it is. And sometimes it can connect back to an unhealed wound from childhood. Mm. Okay. My tagline, yeah, my tagline in my business is betrayal uncovers the truth. Okay. Because I believe that betrayal uncovers all of those truths inside of us that we need to acknowledge. Right. So what can you tell us more about that? How, um, because the way I am hearing it is that betrayal, so it's something that we are, we were betrayed, betrayed, yes. but it's kind of, a, it's a place that we know already, a place that we have been there before. Is that, that what you're trying to say? Every yes Every one of us has been betrayed and every one of us has betrayed ourselves. Okay. And especially as women, we will sacrifice ourselves for the good of everybody else. Yes. And when we have that real painful experience where somebody else has done it to us, it rips the scab off that wound inside. And suddenly that's when we're faced with that choice. I need to start showing up for myself in new and different ways again. Right. So it becomes an opportunity to heal in that way, instead of just pushing it down and, and letting it fester there and impregnate all our future relationships. Is that right? Absolutely right. Absolutely. Yeah, it is an opportunity. It's an opportunity we don't want in the moment. But everybody that I have worked with, so many people that I know are the most grateful for their hardest experiences because of the person they become after. Yes. Well, that that was my my story, my example, I, I was betrayed and, uh, you know, it ended up being a stepping stone to become my best self, to learn about relationships and uh, all, yes, how to be a better woman in a way. Not that there was anything wrong with me, but there were some missing parts in my communication style, in my emotional maturity that, uh, you know, once I took care of that, I became um, a better able partner and I attracted a man that he he won't cheat on me. While the first one, he gave me all the red flags in the entire world that he was going to end up doing that and I didn't see them somehow. Right. Yeah. 
And some of that is like what I was talking about with the self-betrayal. How many of us have seen those red flags and have not done anything about it right. because maybe we didn't trust ourselves. Right. Yeah. So that's something that came up when I was uh, reading up on you. Um, that's something that I thought how connected self-confidence is with betrayal. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? How intimately related they are? Yeah. Oh, I'm glad you made that connection because yes, so much. We all have, no matter how we've been raised, just by living in this world, most kids are raised to listen to your parents, listen to your teachers, listen to the church, listen to whoever, the community. We're yeah. raised to be good girls and to make other people happy. But what it does is it disconnects us with that inner knowing with our inner wisdom. Mm. And then like that, we start looking to other people for the answers. Mm. And when we do that, it makes us progressively less and less and less confident because we think, well, my boss knows better. My parents know better. My husband knows better. My partner knows better. My friend, she knows better. Right. And then the more we rely on other people and then when things go wrong, instead of realizing, oh, they don't know any more than I do. We start thinking, I must be really hopeless. Mm -hmm. I must be really stupid because I relied on the smartest person I know, my parents, my husband, my whatever, and it didn't work out. When the truth, the real truth of the matter is, none of us are experts. All of us have different areas in our life where we know more and where we've learned more. But ultimately, we have to trust our own hearts, our mm -hmm. own wisdom, and make decisions that we know on some level are best for us. Right, right. That's super, super important to, to learn how to trust our intuition and our inner knowing. And so something that, um, that I would like you to, to talk a little bit, if you don't mind, is how the cheater so mm -hmm. it's not about the women now it's about the men how yes. the cheater deals with that behavior of being a cheater that's something that I never thought about it until I did some research on you I never thought about him but how they ration they rationalize it how they basically how they are okay with cheating it's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> there, yeah, there is a whole psychology behind that. Okay. And I want to preface this by saying all situations are unique, but there are several types of affairs. And bottom line, all cheaters cheat because of the way they feel about themselves. Okay. It is a strategy. Cheating mm. is a strategy, just like reading self-help books is a strategy. Right. You know what I mean? I know what you mean. <laughs> exactly. Drinking is a strategy. Drug use is a strategy. Shopping can be a strategy. Working out can be a strategy. There's all of these strategies that people use to make themselves feel better. Okay. So yes. he's cheating. the baseline is he's cheating to make himself feel better. Yes. He has a hole in himself. He can't communicate. He can't identify what's wrong with him. He feels worthless in life. He feels entitled because he's afraid that he's worthless. Mm. Hurt people hurt people right. and cheaters hurt. And cheating is their strategy, their way to try to make themselves feel better. And it becomes a bottomless pit, a circular argument where they start cheating and they feel worse about themselves. So then they think I'm going to cheat more to make myself feel better. And they're oh, stuck wow. down. Wow. Wow. So yes, I love the analogy you, you made with uh, an addiction. It's like you, you drink and and then you feel bad about drinking so you drink more to forget that you are drinking like the little prince book did you read the little prince yes of course <laughs> yes why do you drink i drink to forget and what do you drink to forget about that i'm drinking but i'm drinking 
Wow, that is amazing. I never heard of that. That is really, really a great, great point because even though it doesn't solve the situation, it just as women having gone through that experience, it makes me feel a little bit better that, you know, that there was nothing I could have done to prevent it. No, nothing at all. You that, that was the constant thing, you know, what could I have done to prevent it? That, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Yeah. Because the cheater is the one that can't identify their, their point of pain. Right. If the cheater was capable of saying, and that's why, again, like when I talked about one of the best ways to heal is to feel what you're feeling and feeling it. If the cheater was able to say, I'm feeling hollow and empty, I'm feeling old and irrelevant. I'm feeling sexually unattractive. I'm feeling neglected. If they can communicate that. Right. It changes everything, but when they can't, that's what leads to the problem. Wow, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. I feel lighter and I'm oh. sure some of the viewer, I hope some of the viewers feel lighter also. Yeah. Now, I have a question for you that um, I know I heard you saying that all situations are different. We are all different, so I, I know that. But <laughs> I, I do have a few parameters for people that my clients, myself, when I went through my process of dating and finding my now husband, and that I give to my clients, a, a, a few people that they shouldn't get into with in relationships with. And one of them is a cheater, a man that is incapable of being faithful. So in your experience, and with all your knowledge and your expertise of all these years working in this area a lot do you believe that i am doing women a favor saying that if a man cheats he's going to cheat because it's on him that he's going to cheat or do you believe that a man can cheat on us and then somehow for x y or c reason he stops cheating mm -hmm. great question if a man does not do the work. If right. they do not go inside and realize, why was I cheating? What is my pain? How was I not able to express that? What was I doing wrong? How was I vulnerable? And what is the strategy that I will use next time? They can actually be less likely to cheat. Okay. Because think about it. You know how we learn from our greatest mistakes? Yes. If you've made a horrible mistake, like driving a car off of a mountain, you're probably not going to do it again because you know, oh, I can't do that. I was driving too fast. I missed that. You're not going to make the same mistake twice if it's really bad and you know why you made the mistake and what to do to stop it. Okay. Gotcha. So yeah, it, it, it depends on what the man is willing to do. He needs to be fully accountable. He needs to do that deep work and he needs to really be able to verbalize why he did it, what need he was fulfilling within himself by doing it and what he is going to do in the future when he starts feeling vulnerable again, shamed again, old and ugly again, irrelevant again. What are you going to do the next time? Right. So in that event, a cheater can be the most faithful partner you have ever had going forward. And then on the flip side, if they're like, uh-uh, it was not my fault. It was her. She did this and I did that. And it's not my fault. If they're blaming, if they're shaming, if they're not being accountable, then run. Because it's their strategy. That strategy works. And they're going to do it every single time. Right. That is marvelous. You know, the analogy that I, I, I was thinking is with, for example, alcoholics. I said, if he is a recovered alcoholic and he went through AA and did the work and is recovering and he's in a process and he did the work, that's fine. They usually are amazing partners because they did the work and they, they are more self-conscious, they are more aware. They're more in touch with who they are. They know who they are, but yeah. if they don't do that, run away. Yeah. 
run, <laughs> run away. I love it, Laura. I love it that for me, I know for you this is common sense because it's your son of genius, but what I am getting is it's it's like an addiction. It's similar to an addiction. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Because most cheaters are very hurt people. Wow. You know, and how do you make yourself feel better? It's a strategy that works. Right. Wow, that is unbelievable. That is so good. So what kind of women usually do you work with? What kind of uh, challenges they bring to your table? Yeah, you know, one of the biggest challenges is the whole obsessive thoughts. Mm -hmm. You know, they can't let it go. I, I'm visualizing, I'm seeing this. That's yeah. one of the biggest challenges. Another one is just figuring out what to do. Because there are so many decisions and for every one decision you make, it opens up like 15 more decisions. You know, it's not just like, do I stay or do I go? Oh, poof, now it's over and it's all, it's, do I stay? Okay, well, now I have to decide, do I move? Do I get a new job? What's going to happen with kids? What's going to happen? So those are the two biggest things, the obsessive thoughts, and then just navigating all of those decisions. The strategy, the strategy of what to do with, with my life. Yes. It's difficult. It's very difficult. And that's something that unfortunately a lot of women stay in relationships because they can't see a way out. They can't see a way. How am I going to survive? How am I going to move on or for the kids? And uh, and have you, have you witnessed any situation where the woman stays in that place and what happens to the relationship? Both. I've seen both good and bad. You know, I've seen it where women are just, they're afraid. And I get that. It is scary. And they stay, but then nothing changes. And over time, it just eats away at their soul. And, you know, those are the people sometimes they'll be like, well, I just don't think we should work together anymore. And, you know, I will try to lovingly call them out. I understand that because it seems like you're not quite ready to take the next step. And that's okay. Let's hold space for you to be not ready, but just pay attention to your heart, pay attention to your soul. If you feel like you're withering, that's a sign something needs to change. If you think about a potted plant, you know, it's going to need water, it's going to need fertilizer, it's going to need sunshine. You move that plant to a different location. Right. Are you withering or are you thriving? reach out when you're ready to thrive. Right. And then I've also worked with women who really have, they've done the work, their partner has done the work and it's the happiest, healthiest their relationship has ever been because they're both so much more self-aware. Right. Well, that that is fantastic news. So there is no, it's not uh, black or white. There is no. As long as there is a willingness to do the work and to to see what's going on and come up with new strategies to deal with uh, life, because life will throw us so many, you know, things that um, sometimes it's a, it's a coping mechanism that is not working. It's not the re the person itself that is at fault. Yeah. And I also want to say too, one of the things that really is within my zone of genius is figuring out your expectations. Because uh -oh. sometimes people will say, I want to stay married, but we're not in love. Mm. And you know, it's just that awareness. What do you want out of a relationship? Because if you each want to stay married, but you each want to live your separate lives, as long as you have those expectations clear within yourself right. and between you and your partner, then that can work out fine too. You know, it's it's problems only come in where you're not aware of what you expect and when you and your partner aren't communicating between each other so you don't know what to rely on within that partnership. Well, that's great that you said that because what I hear is that you are normalizing in a way that we all enter a relationship with different expectations. We all have different needs. And sometimes it's kind of like overseen. It's kind of like everybody's like, oh, I want uh, to get married because I want intimacy, connection, somebody that adores me and desire and devotion. And not everybody wants that. Exactly right. And that's okay. 
as long as you both agree, this is what we want out of our partnership. I always tell my people, yes, marriage, you know, my background is an attorney. Marriage is a contract. When you write a contract, you put the terms into it right. and you each agree. So whatever relationship you're creating going forward, let's put the terms in, let's agree to it, and then let's move forward. And that can look any kind of way that you want it to be because it's your marriage. It's not my marriage. It's right. yours. Right. Have you found out some guidelines regarding when in the process of the relationship unfolding is good to bring those topics of agreements and, you know, what do I want? What do you want? Sometimes it's hard to, it's too early. Oh, it's too, I'm already married. I'm, you know, it's too late. Or have you, do you have any kind of guidelines in that regard? Yeah, that's a great question. Ideally, we would do it before marriage and we would be totally <laughs> self-aware and we would figure it out. But the thing is we change and we evolve over time right. and we have different beliefs. And when I had kids, I became a different person. When I was working as an attorney, I was a different person. Like we grow and we evolve. And I really think it's a good idea just as a practice that on their anniversary, couples should just sit down and review the year. Oh my God, that's wonderful. Love it. Yeah. And then just look at the year going forward. You don't have to hammer everything out, but just like a business does a business review, what went well, right. what do we need to improve and what are our goals for next year? Oh my God. Love that. Love that. That is, it takes a lot of self-confidence to do that. Yes. And I love that you've mentioned self-confidence twice because so often people will come to me and they'll say, how do I get self-confidence? Yeah. And I always tell them you get self-confidence by taking courageous action. Right. And it's uncomfortable to take courageous action, but that's what builds the confidence. It's like saying, how do I get strong? I will lift weights when I get strong. No, you've got to lift the weights and be uncomfortable in order to get strong. Right. Right. It's the little things that we do that are in, you know, in our uncomfort zone that build confidence. And sometimes we think we have to make huge changes, but um, maybe starting with small things. And then, and another thing that I notice is that as humans, we usually fear things like the fear that we have, like in this case, having our conver yearly conversation with our husband, doing like a balance. And the thing that we fear the most usually is not there. Isn't it that funny? Right, right. And yeah. even if there is something big there, wouldn't you rather know and keep tabs on it year at a time so you can make a conscious decision versus looking back over your life and thinking, I wasted the last 20 years in a relationship that I knew 20 years ago wouldn't bring me happiness. Right. Yes. Those are 20 years that you are not getting back and life is way too short. It goes by so fast. It does. It does. I know that all too well. <laughs> Me too. So I'm curious, how did you switch from being a lawyer, an attorney, mm -hmm. uh, to being uh, in this profession, in this area that is so much, it's different. It's so different. It it's is. It's so interesting. I started off as a corporate attorney because my focus was justice and creating justice in the world and righting wrongs. Like my passion is righting wrongs. Oh. And I burned out at work. I had two kids under two. My husband was traveling. It was just really difficult. Wow. So I walked away and I thought I'm interested in health in mental well-being. And I thought there are so many people at work who are like me, who are just struggling to hold it all together. And I thought corporate wellness, women's wellness, this is going to be such a perfect place for me. And I did all of this stuff. And I did women's wellness from 2007, I think, until I found out that my husband was cheating on me. Oh, no. Wow. Yeah. And he cheated on me. This is unbelievable for 15 years I had no idea that's so with, scary that is the scary part you know scary yeah with multiple women oh. and it was 
horrible. It was the worst thing that had ever happened to me. But as I recovered, as I went through this journey, I realized how beautifully aligned it was because the work that I was doing around all that wellness and the body and the mind and the spirit, it was setting me up to do this betrayal recovery work. And this was just the next level, yeah, of me up leveling within myself. And it was the next level of me being able to really make an impact on the lives of women everywhere. And it has been a very difficult journey, obviously, but the most beautiful expression of who I am. And I feel like this is where I'm fully able to use all of my gifts. Oh my God. I love it. I love it. Wow. So you really have been in the trenches. Oh yeah. Yeah. So from your experience in all these years going and through going through your own experience of infidelity and betrayal, if you could give one piece of wisdom that you think is very important to our viewers, uh, maybe are going through something like that, or they have been through something like that and they can't move on. I, I have uh, had experiences with clients that were betrayed and the hardest part for them was to not go back to the guy. Not you know, And now with social media, it's really difficult because they go back to their profile and they look that he's with another woman. Or, so if you could give one piece of advice or wisdom to these ladies, what would that be? Mm, there's so many things I would love to say. <laughs> I so think the <laughs> exactly. I think the biggest one really is to let them know that they do have a choice. Whatever they choose to do, they can. They just have to feel alignment in that choice and to trust the wisdom of their head but most importantly, their heart and their soul as well, Mm -hmm. because they have the choice to make this experience the best thing that ever happened to them or the worst thing that ever happened to them. So when they make a choice, they have to own it. They have to embody it and they have to fully be the choice that they are making. You have the choice and be that choice. Right embrace it make it the knowing like a full body knowing love it thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your expertise there is anything else you would like to say before we wrap it up or thank you so much for having me what i do want to say to anybody who's been through any sort of betrayal but especially infidelity is yes the journey is difficult keep going From the other side, it is absolutely better than you could have anticipated. And that I can promise. Right. I testify to that too. Thank you so much, Laura. And I know you have a beautiful gift for our viewers. So would you mind to share it a little bit? I do. I have got my Sparkle After Betrayal Recovery Guide. And yes, it's amazing. You can get it if you go to betrayalrecoveryguide.com. I will place the link underneath the video. So it's going to be really, really easy to get it. Oh, perfect. What it is, it's just a short guide of three things that you can do right now that will help you navigate through your betrayal recovery journey that will help you return home to who you are. So you feel clear and confident and courageous in the decisions that you're making. Thank you so much. Sounds amazing. So ladies, go and grab it. And thank you for being here with us. I truly enjoy uh, interviewing you. It's so enlightening. You, I really have so many aha moments. Oh, good. Thank you so much for having me.